friends, this is Colleen. And this is Margaret. And we're, we're the Cousins Weird! And this is our special Victorian Christmas ghost story time. Yes, there'll be scary ghost stories and tales of the glories of Christmases long, long ago. There's a reason why that line is in that song. Yes. Because it used to be tradition to read ghost stories around the fire during Yule time, right? And I'm sure if most of you thought hard, you could think of one of the most famous Victorian ghost stories of all time. Think about it. Story about a Scrooge who gets <laughs> yeah. visited by three I ghosts. Yes, yeah. uh, it's a Christmas carol. You know, no one knows like where the original origins come from for why it started that way because or when it particularly started because it was an oral tradition they would pa- they would tell the stories around a fire it wasn't written down. We need to bring that that tradition back because yeah. I'm all for it. I think it's awesome. And, and when Colleen yeah. suggested this, I'm like, "Hell yeah." I'm like this our special this year should be and we've done the history of Christmas and we've talked about this in other episodes in years past and I always had in the back of my head, like, we should do that for our, our special, our Yule. And we're recording on Yule. Yes. Couldn't it's be any better. Happy Winter Solstice. Yes. It's the longest night. I watched the sunset as I came over here. Colleen got me one of my most favorite presents ever. She got me a <laughs> tiny jewel box. And it made me giddy and happy. And yeah. I freaking love it so much. <laughs> I have a jewel box right next. He's sitting right next to my Yule log on my mantle. Oh. Right I now. like, I'm so happy. I, I'm like, where am I going to put him when I get home? Then is it going to get destroyed by my children or my or cats? cats? Yeah, cats probably like to chew on to that. Chew on him, yeah. I'm sure if it fell off my mantle, Bentley would eat it. Positive he would. So, we're going to tell you some ghost stories that we have found. Um, you know, there's books, there's so many different places to find ghost stories. These are ones, ghost storytelling was very big in like England. Right. And when, when we came over to, when they came to here, it didn't like carry over. We were very, like, we're so uptight. Yeah. And a lot of it had to do with the fact that the Puritans Mm -hmm. didn't even want to celebrate Christmas. Think about how, there are are people now who don't celebrate Halloween because it's Satan's holiday. Right. Like, so it's not, but you know. It was, one of the reasons why they believe it was a thing for one is. It was a like the the mortality rate of people was pretty high. Oh, they did yeah. not live long, so no. death was a the spiritualism was a big thing during that that time, mm-hmm. and all these like babies that were dying left and right. People had TB. People had you know they didn't live long, so death was a big thing. So it was one of those things that you couldn't escape. Right. So you know it was like a part of life. But they also... I mean, not that we can escape it now, but it was more prevalent and people were aware, more aware of... And they like, talked it, about it more. Right, right. And not even in a bad way. And also, if you think about um, ghosts and s- spiritual things like that, um, it's a way to stay connected to people you lost, right? So yeah. talking about these stories isn't really... It's like almost a hopeful thing. Like you never lose connection with the people that you lost. And... Here, we didn't want to do that. and We didn't want to think about that. And, I mean, now we don't, our, you know, life expectancy is way higher than it used to be. Oh, yeah. And we think it's almost morbid. But it was, if you think about it also, back then, you had to come inside and retire for the night earlier because there was no electricity. Right. You couldn't continue your work outdoors. And it didn't matter your economic status. Like, if you were a farmer, if you were, you know, worked the land, or if you were a rich person, you were gathered around the fire. It was cold. Right. So, you're gathered around the fire. There's no electricity. There's nothing really to do. So, you told stories. And what more fun than telling a ghost story? Yeah. I'm all for it. I'm all for it, too. So, we found a few stories we want to share with you guys. And we thought we would release this right before Christmas so that you could... Sit around your fire. Put one on your TV if you got to. Light a candle. Maybe mm-hmm. I'll put... You know what I want to do? I'm going to put the sound of a crackling fire in the background of our yes. episode. We're in our basement and there is a wood stove, but we're not sure the state of the chimney. 
So I thought we should light, we should have a fire going here, and then we're like, well, your mom will come home with a house full of smoke, and that would be very. I don't know what I'm her. doing, so that wouldn't be good. It's been a while. It's been a minute since I even opened that fireplace, so and I don't know what the chimney situation is, but we want you to enjoy a old fashioned Christmas tradition, and we're gonna read some stories to you. Um, do you want me to go first? Or you want to go first? You go first. Okay. So the first, what I did was there was a, there's a lot of books and stuff, but I ended up going onto Reddit and just looking up what people wrote about like their favorite, uh, fireside ghost stories, like Christmas tales. And I kind of got some ideas from that. I am crocheting as Connie's telling these yeah. stories. So we it have the cozy. whole coziness factor because I'm is. furiously trying to finish up special orders for people for Christmas. <laughs> She has, she's like, I have to crochet as we do this. I don't have time. I don't have time. So the story I'm going to read you is called Christmas Meeting by Rosemary Temperley. Um, and this is on rollercoaster.com. This is where I found this specific. It was linked in Reddit, so I went to it. So we're going to read this story. I have never spent, spent Christmas alone before. It gives me an uncanny feeling sitting alone in my furnished room with my head full of ghosts and a room full of voices of past. It's a drowning feeling, all Christmases of the past coming back in the mad jumble, the childish Christmas with a house full of relations, a tree in the window, sixpence in the pudding, and delicious crinkling stockings in the dark morning, the adolescent Christmas with mother and father, the war and the bitter cold and the letters from abroad, the first really grown-up Christmas with a lover, the snow and the enchantment, red wine and kisses and the walk in the dark before the mo- midnight with the ground so white and the stars diamond bright in this black sky so many christmases through the years <laughs> this is poetic and pretty it really is and now the first christmas alone but not quite loneliness a feeling of companionship with all the other people who are spending christmas alone millions of them past and present a feeling that if I close my eyes, there will be no past or future, only the endless present, which is time because it is all we ever have. Yes, however cynical you are, however irreligious, it makes you feel queer to be alone at Christmas time. So I am absurdly relieved when the young man walks in. There's nothing romantic about it. I'm a woman nearly 50. Oh, gosh, she's a spinster. <laughs> oh, she does. I'm a woman nearly 50. Me too, friend. And it says, a spinster school ma'am with grim, dark hair and myopic eyes that once were beautiful. Because we're old, haggard beasts now, Margaret. I know, really. Oh, my God. And he's a kid of 20. He's <laughs> only half her age, whatever. Rather unconventionally dressed with a flowing wine-colored tie and a black velvet jacket and a brown curls, which could... Do with a taste of a barber's scissors. He's a vampire. The effemacy of his dress is bellied by his features. Narrow, totally a freaking vampire. Narrow, piercing blue eyes. An arrogant, jutting nose and chin. His nose is so arrogant. He's got an arrogant nose. How is a nose arrogant? I don't understand. Is it in the air? <laughs> arrogant chin. Oh, it's jutting. He's like jutting out. Paint in a picture. Yes. Not that he looks strong. The skin is fine drawn over the prominent features, and he is very white. He bursts in without knocking, then pauses, says, I'm sorry, I thought this was my room. He begins to go out, then hesitates and says, Are you alone? Uh, yes. Creeper. Like, uh, I'm sorry, if someone asked me, I'm like, no, my husband will be back. It's like, no, I'm not alone. I have a big... Burly husband. Burly husband that will be here any minute. It's queer being alone on Christmas, isn't it? May I stay and talk? I'd be glad if you would. He comes right in and sits down by the fire. I hope you don't think I came in here on purpose. I really did think it was my room, he explains. I'm glad you made the mistake, but you're a very young person to be alone on Christmas time. I wouldn't go back to the country to my family. It would hold up my work. I'm a writer. I see. I can help smile. I can't help smiling a little. That explains his rather unusual dress. And And he's a vampire. And he takes himself so seriously, this young man. Of course you mustn't waste precious moments of uh, your precious, precious moments of writing. 
I say with a twinkle. No, not a moment. She's twinkling at him. That's, well, with her haggard face, I can't With imagine. her haggard <laughs> eyes, I know. <laughs> That's what my family won't see. They don't appreciate urgency. Families are never quite appreciative of our, of our, arti- of artistic nature. No, they aren't, he agrees seriously. What are you writing? Poetry and a diary combined. It's called My Poems and I by Francis Rendell. That's my name. My family says there's no point in my writing that I am too young. But I don't feel young. Sometimes I feel like an old man with too much to do before he dies. Revolving faster and faster on the wheel of creativeness. (laughs) Creativityness? Creativeness. 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 (laughs) Yes, yes, exactly. You understand. You must read my work sometime. Please read my work. Read my work. (laughs) <laughs> a little aggressive. A note of desperation in his voice, a look of fear in his eyes, makes me say, We're both getting much too solemn for Christmas Day. I'm going to make you some coffee and have plum cake. I move about, clattering cups, spooning coffee into my percolator. But I must have offended him, for when I looked around, I found he had left. I'm absurdly disappointed. Absurdly? Absurdly. I finish making coffee, however, then turn to the bookshelf in the room. It is piled high with volumes, for which have the landlady has apologized profusely. Hope you don't mind the books, miss, but my husband won't part with them. There's nowhere to put them. We charge a bit less for this room for that reason. I don't mind, I said. Books are good friends. But these aren't very friendly-looking books. I take one at random, or does some strange fate guide my hand? Sipping my coffee, inhaling my cigarette smoke, I begin to read the battered little book published, I see, in spring 1852. It's mainly poetry, amateur stuff, but vivid. Then there's a kind of diary, more realistic, less affected. Out of curiosity to see if there is any amusing comparisons, I turn to the entry for Christmas Day, 1851. I read, My First Christmas Alone. I had rather an odd experience. When I went back to my lodgings after a walk, there was a middle-aged woman in my room. I thought, at first, I had walked into the wrong room, but this was not so, and after a pleasant talk, she disappeared. I suppose she was a ghost, but I wasn't frightened. I liked her, but I do not feel well tonight. Not at all well. I have never felt ill at Christmas before. A publisher's note followed the last entry. Francis Riddell, died from a sudden heart attack at the night of Christmas Day, 1851. The woman mentioned in his final entry in his diary was the last person to see him alive. In spite of his requests for her to come forward, she never did. Her identity remains a mystery. So who was the ghost? Was there a parallel universe? universe? They say that happens. Oh. There's stories of that happening where yeah, people cross each other or come into each other's walk into a room and they're like have conversations and then realize they're not even I'm actually just started watching a show called Bodies and it's that same idea. I've only watched episode 1 and it it takes place in Great Britain. It's on I think Netflix. You should look it up. Like if you think of these kind of things it's showing that time isn't linear. Right. Right? It's all happening at the same time. And that's why sometimes you cross over. Yeah. Pretty cool. It is pretty cool. Would you like to read? Well, I read. And I'm woefully un- underprepared. Colleen, I'm sure, read her book, her stories ahead of time. I have no idea what this story is about because I just looked up a title that sounded interesting and I'm going to read that one. I like it. This came from the book called The Valancourt Book of Victorian Ghost Stories and it's volume two. And the song is titled The Haunt the Song. <laughs> The story is titled The Haunted Tree by Anonymous. Ooh. Anonymous. Anonymous. About 50 years since, upon one of the plains which overspread large portions of the southwestern part of Maine, certain mysterious things obtruded themselves upon the notice of the community. They startled the thoughtless, puzzled the philosophic, set the superstitious all agog, and made the timid tremble. Ooh. Unaccountable sounds were heard there, unnatural signs were seen, and often, without any visible cause, dogs, cattle, and horses were terribly affrighted. Ooh, affrighted. A pine tree, 
which stood by the roadside and which overshadowed the way with its spreading branches, marked that spot which was noted for its wonders. It was tall, straight, and well-proportioned, as fair to look upon as its neighbors, and still under its deep shadows all these unaccountable phantoms appeared. The surrounding forest was thickly studded with the same stately growth. In the light of day, it was harmless when the sun pressed its bright rays through that dark forest. When all natural objects were unmistakably distinct and visible, no fearful sight nor sound alarmed the passing man or beast. But when the eve of day was closed, when deep night doubly thick and heavy under those green overshadowed treetops, wrapped all things in sable curtains. Then these disturbing forces infested the place and let loose these marvels. It must be affirmed, however, that this tree did not stand in the most frightful spot traced by that lonesome highway. It was not in the middle of that gloomy forest. It stood nearer the side which bordered on the thickest settlement. Not far above it lay a dark, deep, chilly hollow, often entered with a shudder. Ooh. I just shuddered. Which <laughs> all would declare was the fit home of ghosts and hobglob- hobgoblins. Hobgoblins. I love that word. To me too. And where practical robbers would naturally select their ambush. Still, it was soon became notorious that this apparently innocent and promising tree was a haunted tree, marked as such by all the surrounding inhabitants, heralded, heralded as such through all that region. It must be added that this spot, which rose into such puzzling notoriety, was about two miles from a dull, unpretentious hamlet, where stories were kept, in which some useful merchandise could be found, but the great article of trade at that time, as it was everywhere, was ardent spirits. Many then regarded strong drink as the elixir of life, which it was surely gliding them into graver difficulties Ooh. than frights and heart beatings at the haunted tree. But business at the shops and the post office, and most of all at the stores licensed to keep and sell fashionable, much-loved beverage, mm. would draw the rustics thither after the toils of the day were ended, many of whom had to pass this haunted tree. I have to know, the prose is pretty awesome yeah like the even just the way they wrote in victorian mm-hmm. times was just it was all romantic amazing. it really was like there's this flow to it it's all like poetry it's mm-hmm. just beautiful as a child could pass it harmless when the light of day guarded the place they would start in season to pass it before the dusky and fearful hour of night licensed the appearance of those terrors but if they went on foot they would always have their dogs accompany them and then not return alone if they could find company. But after taking a social glass, doing their business, listening to the gossip of the day, hearing the last reported scare at the tree, they would linger to discuss these mysterious appearances, pro and con, and avow their belief or disbelief in them. Some who were constant attendants upon the preaching of the uneducated, unpolished, but deeply pious minister of the place, would take a still more serious view of these things. They would say, These mysterious sights and sounds mean something. They augur of crime, secret, dark, and heaven-daring. God is making inquisition for blood. Murder will out until the awful secret is divulged that spot will be haunted. Mm. This would disturb the serenity of the man behind the counter. He prided himself as above belief in ghosts, witches, and phantoms, as too intelligent to swallow down such admissions of spiritual manifestations or of supernatural appearances. And he would say, nonsense, nonsense. It is all imagination, all whims, all superstition. But at length, his own turn came to try these troubles and to see if it was all bosh and gammon. Returning home one evening upon that road, as he approached the haunted tree, his horse stopped short and stubbornly refused to pass it. It would no more go go forward than the beast upon which Balaam rode when the angel of the Lord with a drawn sword in his hand confronted him. This perplexed and disconcerted our merchant, but it was no place to be angry. 
Though he neither saw nor heard anything unusual himself, his noble horse was trembling with fear and unwilling to advance. Uh, me too. Yeah, as if the <laughs> road was bristling with armed hobgoblins. He whipped and goaded him on till with a desperate plunge he dashed out into the thick, scraggy bushes, rushed by the obnoxious tree, and ran at the top of his speed until he brought up, panting and trembling, at his own stable door. Another incident which is hard to put aside as a mere phantasm. An elderly man of a bold, defiant spirit was passing that way in a partially intoxicated state. No. Oh. A son of six or eight years and his faithful dog were with him. As they drew near the tree, a light was seen, as if some invisible hand was holding a lantern. The old man cheered his dog to an attack. Bristling and barking, he bravely struck for the light when it moved out into the forest. Our tippling friend, more daring than usual just then, attempted to follow it. Up to that point, the courage of the boy held out, as he informed the writer, as he saw nothing but a light and that retreating before the dog. But when the father turned into the bushes, he was thoroughly affrighted and wished to hasten home if not forbade it. But the light soon faded, the dog became composed, the father returned to the road, and another wonder was reported. Oh. This sounds like a person who's writing, a, like, account of, like, people people's telling, telling him yeah. what happened and why this tree was haunted. So mm -hmm. this might, like, be based on, like, folklore from the area. It could be. That's what it says. It's reading like that, anyway. Sometimes these same persons would pass unmolested. Silence reigning <laughs> that through the whole through the whole forest, and no unearthly sight disturbed them. Some passed frequently in night's deepest darkness and never saw or heard anything strange or supernatural. Such was the case with a young physician whose practice often led him by that place. He was a man of integrity, every way reliable, generous, and kind in spirit, keeping a clear conscience toward all men. He was fearless of both the dead and living, and often in the still hours of night rode by the tree, calling upon any one who had anything to make known to come and tell it. But he had no vision of these things. Those who were molested by these unaccountable manifestations molested. <laughs> were usually struck dumb, passed it as best they could, and gave no challenge. On a snowy winter day, two men of good habits, sound judgment, and unquestionable veracity, which means they weren't big drinkers, mm -hmm. sound habits, yeah, <laughs> or good habits anyway, they were passing by that place with wagons heavily laden. The falling snow had become quite deep. They plodded slowly through it, beguiling their dreary way with occasional conversation. As one of them was observing that nobody ventured out, the storm was so severe, they both looked forward and saw an old and peculiar, peculiarly dressed Ooh, man. I have hard trouble word. with that word. I have trouble with that Yeah. Word, Footing it through the deep snow toward them. Both noticed him, saw that he was a stranger to them, but in all his appearances, a veritable man. The driver of the foremost wagon went forward to get his horses a little out of the road to give the venerable stranger an easier passage by, and, behold, no one was to be seen. Looking around in every direction and seeing no one, he asked his companion if he saw a man just before approaching them. He replied that he did. What had become of him? He could not tell. They stopped their wagon and made search, but could not discover any track in the snow, neither in the road where they thought they saw him, nor in any direction by which he might turn aside. Yet they both ever affirmed that they could not have been mistaken, and that the form and dress and motions of a veritable man surely appeared to them. Ooh, pooky. Thus, several years passed on, the list of unnatural manifestations lengthened. The wonders of the haunted tree grew more and more wonderful, until they reached their climax in a face-to-face -face interview. The mystery was then solved, the curtain dropped, and no more troubles have been experienced. Upon one of these fertile ridges which rise from the plain, there lived a young man, truthful in speech, industrious in his habits, of strong nerve, and not especially superstitious. Upon a bright moonlit night in the month of September, he was returning from the store at an early hour, alone, but in a state of calm sobriety. 
Reaching the haunted tree, the horse upon which he rode came to a dead stand and would not be urged further. Nothing unusual was there visible to the rider. He coolly dismounted, stepped before the horse, and led him without any unwillingness to follow his rider by that fearful place. Having passed the gulf safe and fearless too, without premeditation, scarcely conscious of what he was doing, he spoke out in a firm voice. If anyone is here who wants anything of me, I would like to see him. Immediately, a man, venerable in appearance, that's how they describe this yeah. spirit or whatever, dressed in a gone-by style with gray locks hanging below a broad-rimmed hat, stood directly before him. Surprised, dismayed, and nearly confounded, he felt that he was sent for, and the worst might as well come. So in trembling tones he asked, What do you want of me? The specter in tones our dismayed friend could never forget proceeded thus. My name is Hiram White. Twenty-five years ago I was robbed of thirty silver dollars and then murdered under this tree. The names of two of the guilty perpetrators of that deed of blood will I give, as they are now living. They were Caleb Walsh and Franklin Ormy. But some parts of that awful scene I cannot relate to you. Read the ninth psalm, and you will apprehend them. I have long hunt haunted this blood-stained spot to make some one inquire for the terrible secret. You are the first person that has challenged me, and now I have divulged it. These things will no more appear. Follow me, and I will show you where they buried my body. Oh, jeez! Uh, the specter led the way into the forest, and our terrified friend followed, feeling that it was no time to oppose or make excuses. Right, he's like, I better listen to this dude. <laughs> Coming to a low, overshadowed shadowed hollow, he affirmed, Here is the place, and instantly vanished. The young man, finding himself unharmed physically and still alive, though the last dread summons could not have caused a greater mental anguish, made his way back to his horse, which, totally undisturbed, had not started from the place where he left him. He rode slowly home, deeply affected by what he had seen and heard. Upon reaching home, his sad and woeful countenance betrayed him. What is the matter? was the first inquiry of his wife. He tried to evade a disclosure, but could not. Unbosoming himself <laughs> freely. <laughs> confidentially to her unbosoming himself don't unbosom yourself i love all these old words <laughs> once let wait okay unbosoming himself freely <laughs> confidently to her it was too momentous too sacred to keep secret once let loose it traveled with lightning speed and power through the community the place pointed out as that where the corpse had been buried was dug open and there sure enough Human bones were found. Bum, bum, bum. But did any other circumstances corroborate the young man's statement? The recollections of the aged were sounded, and some of them remembered that a man bearing the name of him who professed to be the victim occasionally vid visited that place as an itinerant preacher about the time referred to in that disclosure. Venerable dressed man. Maybe that's what Venerable that meant. Dressed. Yep. And his visit suddenly ceased, and he was not afterwards heard from. But as he came from a distant place in New Hampshire and was somewhat eccentric, his non-appearance excited no surprise. His profession as a preacher may explain the peculiar, peculiar, that's a wicked word, peculiarness <laughs> of his sending his auditor to imprecatory psalm to find the supplement of his awful disclosure. Another fact is well verified. About the same date of this alleged crime, a stray horse with his saddle turned and bridle on was found in the highway about two miles from this noted tree. Nobody thought to look for who owned this horse. Nah, it was like, oh, that's That weird. was like your car. It's like leaving your, oh, somebody just found this car by the side. Yeah. Like, we just took it home, you know. Yeah. Like, that's the it's same like, oh, idea. Huh, interesting. And then moved on with your life. It was advertised. A green wife was kept upon his neck for several months, as the law required, but no owner ever claimed it. It remained with the person who picked it up. The names given as the perpetrators of this revolting deed were not unknown, were not fictitious. They had lived and left families there, and these were sensitive and disturbed by these grave charges. They had died, too. 
and it was now remembered that the last trying scene with them was marked with long and intensified agonies. Ooh. Beyond all precedents, they rolled and struggled in the grasp of a grim monster, but seemed forbid to die till conscience was relieved by some deathbed confession. With one of them, it did come, but came to be locked up in the bosom of its recipient. After long and severe throes and awful moaning, he requested all present to leave the room, save one aged, intimate neighbor. With a charge of perfect secrecy, he entrusted to him the agonizing burden which no other ear must hear. This done, death completed his work. The waiting and anxious friends came in, but could only learn what they could read upon the troubled visage of him who possessed the dying secret of the departed. Evidently, an awful disclosure had been made, but none could draw it from its appointed hiding place. Okay, I'm sorry. If your neighbor says, I had to tell you a big secret, but you can't tell anyone, yeah. and they told you and then died, I would tell everybody. Uh, Especially like, if he who's... killed someone. He killed someone, for God's sakes. I mean, he's not going to go to jail now. He's dead. Like, you don't have to keep your secret to a dead person. They're oh dead. God. They don't care. Maybe they were afraid of getting haunted or something. Yeah. I'm oh, sorry I picked such a long, long story. No, it's fine. Such were the firm impressions left upon the minds of the staid, honest-hearted, and more intelligent of that people. No one could convince them that these things were mystical or empty phantoms. They retained the recollection of these mysteries, mysterious adventures without attempting any other explanation than that which we have given. The end. Very interesting. What I've read about it is... They couldn't tell the origins because it was all, it was oral tradition. Like, when did this start? But they did eventually start writing down these. There's, there's like, Charles Dickens, he has other ghost stories that were read and they were put out in periodicals and, like, magazines at the time. And they were meant for you to read by your fireside and this, in the cold nights of winter. So these stories were meant to be read during this time. They used to print them in the newspaper, too. Yeah. Um, I wanted to repeat that the book that I got that story out of was called The Valancourt Book of Ghost... I'm sorry. The Valancourt Book of Victorian Christmas Ghost Stories, Volume 3, edited by Simon Stern. It doesn't say, like... It just has an editor. But I, I think it's because these are stories are written by other people. Yeah. And that was an anonymous <laughs> Yes, that was writer. an anonymous writer on that one. So, I'm going to read the story called A Strange Christmas Game by Charlotte Riddle, and this is on the shortstoryproject.com, another one I found um, listed in the Reddit thread I was reading. It was the middle of November when we arrived at Martingdale and found the place anything but romantic or pleasant. The walks were wet and sodden, and the trees were leafless. There were no flowers save a few late pink roses blooming in the garden. It had been a wet season, and the place looked miserable. Claire would not ask Alice down to keep her company in the winter months, as she had intended. And for myself, the Cronsons were still absent in New Norfolk, where they meant to spend Christmas with old Miss Cronson now recovered. Altogether, Martingdale seemed dreary enough, and the ghost stories we had laughed at while sunshine flooded the room became less unreal when we had nothing but blazing fires and wax candles to dispel the gloom. They became more real, also, when the servants after servant left us to seek situations elsewhere, when noises grew frequent in the house, when we ourselves, Claire and I, with our own ears, heard tramp, tramp, the banging and the clattering which had been described to us. My dear reader, you doubtless are free from superstitious fancies, you poo-poo the existence of ghosts. Poo-poo. 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 And only wish you could find a haunted house in which to spend the night. Which is all very brave and praiseworthy. But wait till you find you are left in a dreary, desolate, old country mansion filled with the most unaccountable sounds without a servant. Oh, you poor thing, without a servant. Without a servant? How terrible. With none... Save an old caretaker and his wife, who, living at the extremist end of the building, heard nothing of the tramp, tramp, bang, bang going on at all hours of the night. At first, I imagined the noises were produced by some evil-disposed person, 
who wished for a purpose of their own to keep the house uninhabited. 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 I was. I thought. I wanted to say uninhabitable. Cause that's really hard to say too. Habitable. But, blah, 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 blah. but by degrees, Claire and I came to the conclusion the visitation must be supernatural, and that Martingdale, by consequence, untenable. Still being practical people, unlike our predecessors, not having money to live where and how we liked, we decided to watch and see whether we could trace any human influence in the matter. If not, it was agreed we were to pull down the right wing of the house and the principal staircase. For nights and nights we sat till two or three o'clock in the morning, Claire engaged in needlework, I reading, with a revolver lying on the table beside me. But nothing, neither sound nor appearance, rewarded our vigil. This confirmed my first idea that the sounds were not supernatural, but just to test but just to test the matter, I determined on Christmas Eve the anniversary of Mr. Jeremy Lester's disappearance, to keep myself in the red bedchamber. Even to Claire, I never mentioned my intention. Are they staying at the old Ram Inn with the red bedchamber? No, but it sounds like it, right? Yeah. About ten, tired out with our previous vigils, we each retired to rest, somewhat ostentatiously, perhaps. I noisily shut the door of my room, and when I opened it half an hour afterwards, no mouth could have pursued its way along the corridor with greater silence and caution than myself. <laughs> Quite in the dark, I sat in the red room. For over an hour, I might as well have been in my grave for anything I could see in the apartment. But at the end of that time, the moon rose and cast a strange light across the floor and upon the wall of the haunted chamber. Hitherto, I kept my watch opposite the window. Now I changed my place to the corner near the door, where I had shaded from observation by the heavy hangings of the bed. Still I sat on, but still no sound broke the silence. I was weary with many nights watching, and tired of my solitary vigil. I dropped at last into slumber, from which I awakened by hearing the door softly open. John! My sister, almost in a whisper. John, are you here? Yes, Claire, I said. But what are you doing up at this hour? Come downstairs, she replied. There are in, they are in the oak parlor. I do not need any explanation as to whom she meant, but crept downstairs after her, warmed by an uplift hand of the necessity of her silence and caution. By the door, by the open door of the oak parlor, she paused, and we both looked in. There was a room we had left in darkness overnight, with a bright wood fire blazing on the hearth. Hearth. <laughs> I was, <laughs> on the hearth. On the I, I was bringing it back, Mark. <laughs> I bring it back. Candles on the chimney piece. The small table pulled out from its accustomed <laughs> corner. Two men seated beside it, playing at cribbage. We could see the face of the younger so player. Do. They, play, they cribbage. play cribbage. It was that of the man about five and twenty, of a man who had lived hard and wickedly who had wasted his substance and his health, who had been a while in the flesh, Jeremy Lester, the man that had disappeared. Oh. It would be difficult for me to say how I knew this, how in that moment I identified the features of the player with those of the man who had been missing 41 years, 41 years that very night. He was dressed in a costume of bygone period. His hair was powdered, and round his wrists there were ruffles of lace. He looked like one of who, having come from some great party, had sat down after his return home to play cards with an intimate friend. On his little finger there sparkled a ring. In the front of his shirt there gleamed a valuable diamond. There were diamond buckles on his shoes, and according to the fashion of his time, he wore knee breeches <laughs> and silk stockings, which showed off advantageously the shape of the remarkable good leg and ankle. <laughs> opposite the door, but never once lifted his he eyes to it. Or looked at a man and said, what a nice ankle. <laughs> I, le remarkable good leg and ankle you have, sir. <laughs> his attention seemed to be concentrated on the card. For a time, there was an utter silence in the room, broken only by the momentous counting of the game. In the doorway we stood, holding our breath, terrified and yet fascinated by the scene, 
which was being acted before us. The ashes dropped onto the hearth softly, and like the snow, we were we could hear the rustle of the cards as they were dealt out and fell upon the table. We listened to the count. Fifteen two, fifteen four, and so forth. Never once have I played cribbage, so I have no clue what that me, has to do with anything. Neither. But there were no other words spoken till the length at length the player, whose face we could not see, explained, I win! The game is mine! His opponent took the cards, sorted them negligently in his hand, and put them close together, and flung the whole pack in his guest's face, exclaiming, Cheat! Liar! Take that! There was a bustle and confusion, a flinging over of chairs, and a fierce gesticulation, (laughs) (laughs) and such a noise of passionate voices mingling that we could not hear a sentence which was uttered. The man's what missing because some guy killed him over cheating over cribbage? All at once, however, Jeremy Lester strode out of the room in so great of a hurry that he almost touched us as we stood out of the room and tramp, tramp up the stairs to the red room, whence he had descended in a few minutes with a couple of rapiers under his arm. Oh, jeez. When he re-entered the room, he gave, as it seemed to us, the other man his choice of the weapons. And when he flung open the window, and after ceremoniously giving place for his opponent to pass out first, he walked forth into the night air. Claire and I followed. We went through the garden and down... You follow and some crazy mad person who's angry with a rapier. rapier. Jeez. <laughs> we went through the garden and down the narrowing winding walk to the smooth piece of turf sheltered from the north by the plantation of a young fir... The plantation of young fir trees. It was a bright moonlit night by this time and we could distinctly see Jeremy Lester measuring off the ground. When you say three, he said at last, to the man whose back was still towards us. They had drawn lots for the ground, and the lot had fallen against Mr. Lester. He stood thus with his moonbeams falling upon him, and the, a handsomer fellow I would never desire to behold. I have a feeling that he has a little crush. I think he does. On Mr. Jeremy Lester. Mr. Lester and his... His fine legs leg and ankle ankles. I never had seen. <laughs> The fact that he's commenting on his... I know. Yeah, he totally like this. He's into this dude. Yeah. One began the other. Two, and before our kinsman had the slightest suspicion of his design, he was upon him and his rapier through Jeremy Lester's breast. At the sight of the cowardly treachery, Claire screamed aloud. In a moment, the combatants had disappeared. The moon was obscured behind a cloud, and we were standing in the shadow of a her plantation shivering in cold and terror but we knew at last we had become of the late owner of martingale that he had fallen not in a fair fight but foully murdered by a false friend over a cribbage over cribbage when late on christmas morning i awoke it was to see a white world to behold the ground the trees the shrubs all laden and covered with snow there was snow everywhere so much snow as no person could remember have falling in 41 years. It was on just such a Christmas as this that Jeremy disappeared, remarked the old sexton to my sister, who had insisted on dragging me through the snow to the church, whereupon Claire fainted away and was carried into the vestry, where I made a full confession to the victor of all we had beheld the previous night. At first, that worthy individual rather inclined to treat the matter lightly, but when a fortnight after the snow melted away and the fir plantation came to be examined, he confessed there might be more things in heaven and earth than his limited philosophy had dreamed of. In a little clear space just within the plantation, Jeremy Lester's body was found. We knew it by the ring and the diamond buckles and the sparkling breast pin. And Mr. Cronson, who in his capacity as magistrate, came over to inspect these relics, was visibly perturbed at my narration. Pray, Mr. Lester, did you in your dream see the face of the gentleman, your kinsman's opponent? No, it. Wait, this was his relative, and he had the hops for him. Weird. Well, it was a different time. It was a different time. Probably, you know, royal, rich people in England, they had a lot of incest happening. <laughs> Here, too. Yeah. In- no, Old I rich answered. People. He sat and stood with his back to us the whole time. There was nothing more, of course, to be done in the matter, observed Mr. Cronson. Nothing, I replied. And there the affair would have terminated, but that a few days afterwards, 
When we were dining at the Cronson Park, Claire all of a sudden dropped the glass of water she, she was carrying to her lips, exclaiming, Look, John, there he is! Rose from her seat and with a face as white as the tablecloth, pointed to the portrait hanging on the wall. I saw him for an instant when he turned his head towards the door as Jeremy left. Jeremy Lester left it, she explained. That is him. Of what followed after this identification, I had only the vaguest recollection. Servants rushed to hither and thither. Hither and thither. Hither and thither. Miss Cronson dropped off her cap chair into hysterics, and the young ladies gathered around their mama. Mr. Cronson, trembling like one in an argue fit, an agu, agu fit, agu, agu, egg, a-g-u-e, an egg, an egg, egg fit. What's an egg fit? It's like the egg. It's like a, it's, they talked about if you had the egg, it was like your body ached. Oh. I think. The egg fit attempted some kind of explanation. While Claire kept praying to be taken away, I took her away, not merely from Cronson Park, but from Martingdale. Before we left the latter place, however, I had an interview with Mr. Cronson, who said the portrait Claire had identified was that of his wife's father, the last person who saw Jeremy Lester alive. (gasps) Cheating at Cribbit. Yeah. He was an old man now, finished Mr. Cronson, a man of over 80, who has confessed everything to me. He won't bring further sorrow and disgrace upon us by making this matter public. Or he, oh, you won't bring further sorrow or disgrace. So he's telling him, don't tell anyone. I promised him I would keep silence, but the story gradually oozed out and the Cronsons left the country. My sister never returned to Martingdale. She married and is living in London. Though I assure her, there are no strange noises in my house. She will not visit Bedfordshire where the little girl she wanted me so long ago to think of seriously is now my wife and the mother of my children. What does that have to do with the rest of the story? Oh. We don't care about the, your wife. We don't, what does she wife and have to do with the story? No. Anyway, yeah. it's hard to read that sometimes. The way they write it, you know, right, the yeah. words. It's this hard is to, like somebody's like, it's like anecdotal, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like somebody's telling a story of, this is my haunting in my house. Yeah. Which is kind of cool, you know. It's it's, not it all... was a cool story. Yeah, it was. And, but it's hard to, like, read it because of the, it's old language. Yeah. Being used, too. Yeah. So, the way they do it. But it's like poetry, still. It's... So, anyway. Jeremy Lester, his cousin, friend, kinsman. Who was telling the story had the hots for him. I can tell that you that. Totally. He lo- totally he was digging his legs and ankles. <laughs> All about those legs and ankles. Never saw a finer leg and ankle. What did he say? What was his exact words? I don't know. Now I gotta look where it says. It's like, dude, it's your cousin. That's gross. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and he's dead. And he's not alive, man. <laughs> he's been dead for 40 years. Not looking. His legs and ankles probably aren't looking If too he good was now. alive, I'm sure his he wouldn't have a fine leg anymore. No. Now I gotta, I'm trying to find it because I need to read what it said again. Oh, here we go. Here, here, here. There were diamond buckles in his shoes, and according to the fashion of his time, he wore knee, knee breeches bridges and silk stockings, which showed off advantageously the shape of a remarkable good leg and ankle. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I do too. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, goodness. It's like, you, dude, that's your cousin. That's your kinsman. Uh, or whatever. <laughs> Okay, and last but not least of the stories we'll be telling. Smee! It's me! Smee! Smee is me! I like to think of his book. I know, right? By A.M. Burridge. Oh, wait. Smee is me! Smee is me. No, said Jackson. Jackson. I can't speak. No, said Jackson with a deprecatory smile. I'm sorry. I do not want to upset your game. I shan't be doing that because you'll have plenty without me. I feel like I have to read this with an accent. Right. But I'm not playing any games of hide and seek. It was Christmas Eve and we were at a party of 14 with just the proper leavening of youth. We had dined well and it was the season for childish games and we were all in the mood for playing them. All, that is, except Jackson. When somebody suggested hide and seek, there was a rapturous and almost unanimous approval. 
his was one dissonant with dissent. I say that dissentient, dissentient voice. Dissension, dissent, dissentient, dissentient voice. Okay, yeah. is it sentient? Dissentient, dissentient voice. Okay, it was not like Jackson to spoil sport or refuse to do as others wanted. Somebody asked him if he is feeling spe- seedy. Are you feeling seedy? No. He I'm going to ask my Jackson that next yeah. time he's acting Are you surly. Seedy? Are you feeling seedy? He'll feel, give me a look. He'll be like, what? What are you hell? talking about? I feel perfectly fit, thanks. But, he added with a smile which softened without retracting the flat refusal. I'm not playing hide and seek. One of us asked him why not. He hesitated for some seconds before replying. I sometimes go and stay at a house where a girl was killed through playing hide-and-seek in the dark. She didn't know the house very well. There were servant staircases with a door to it. When she was pursued, she opened the door and jumped into what must have been, she must have thought was one of the bedrooms, and she broke her neck at the bottom of the stair. Yikes. We all looked Pleasant. concerned, and Mr. Fernley said, How awful! And you were there when that happened? Jackson shook his head very gravely. No, he said. But I was there when something else happened. Something worse. Worse than someone breaking their neck and dying, dude? <laughs> something worse. I shouldn't have thought anything could be worse. This was, said Jack and Jackson, and shuddered visibly. Or so it seemed to me. Well, yeah, because you didn't weren't the one that broke their neck. Right. I think he wanted to tell a story and was angling for encouragement. A few requests which may have seemed to him to lack urgency. He affected to ignore and went off on a tan- at a tangent. I wonder if any of you have played a game called Smee. Mm-mm. It's a great improvement on the ordinary game of hide and seek. The name derives from the ungrammatical colloquialism. It's me. It's me. It's me. Wait, you, it's me, it's me. It's me, it's me. You might care to play if you're going to play a game of that sort. Let me tell you the rules. Every player is present, is presented with a sheet of paper. All sheets are blank except one, on which is written Smee. Nobody knows who Smee, who is Smee, except Smee himself, or herself, as the case may be. The lights are then turned out, and Smee slips from the room and goes off to hide. And after an interval, the other players go off in search, without knowing whom they are actually searching for. One player meeting other challenges with the word Smee, and the other player, if not the one concerned, answers Smee. The real Smee makes no answer when challenged, and the second player remains quietly by him. Presently, they will be discovered by a third player who, having challenged and received no answer, will link up with the first two. This goes on until all the players have formed a chain, and the last to join is marked down for a forfeit. It's a good, noisy, romping game, and in a big house, it often takes a long time to complete the chain. You might care to try it, and I'll pay, and I'll pay my forfeit and smoke one of Tim's excellent cigars here by the fire until you get tired of it. I remarked that it sounded a good game and asked Jackson if he had played himself. Yes, he answered. I played in that house I was telling you about. And she was there, the girl who broke. No, no, Mr. Fernley interrupted. He told us he wasn't there when it happened. Jackson considered. I did not know if she was there or not. I'm afraid she was. I know that there were 13 of us, and there ought only had been 12. And I'll swear that I did, didn't did know her name, or I think I should have gone clean off my head when I heard that whisper in the dark. No, you don't catch me playing that game, or any of it like it, anymore. It spoiled my nerve quite a while, and I can't afford to take a long holiday. Besides, it saves a lot of trouble and inconvenience to own up at once to being a coward. Tim Vouse, the best of hosts, smiled around at us, and in the smile there was a meaning which is sometimes vulgarly expressed by the slow clothing of one eye. There's a story coming, he announced. There's certainly a story of sorts, said Jackson, but whether it's coming or not, he paused and shrugged his shoulders. Well, we're going to pay a forfeit instead of playing. Please, but have a heart and let me down lightly. It's not just a sheer cussedness on my part. Payment in advance, 
said Tim, ensures honesty and promotes good feelings. You were therefore sentenced to tell the story here and now. And here follows Jackson's story, unrevised by me and passed on without comment to a wider public. Some of you I know have run across the Sangstons. Christopher Sangston and his wife, I mean. There are distant connections of mine, at least Violet Sangston is. About eight years ago, they had bought a house between the North and South Downs on the Surrey and Sussex border. Five years ago, they invited me to come and spend Christmas with them. It was a fairly old house. I couldn't say exactly what period, and it certainly deserved a epithet rambling. It wasn't a particularly big house, but the original architect, whoever he had been, had not concerned himself with encompassing in space, and at first you could get lost in it quite easily. Well, I went down for that Christmas, assured by Violet's letter that I knew most of the fellow guests and that there, the two or three who might be strangers to me were all lambs. That's such a, like, 30s thing or 50s thing to say. You're such a lamb. Yeah. Unfortunately, I'm one of the world's workers and couldn't get away until Christmas Eve, although the other members of the party had assembled on the preceding day. Even then, I had cut it rather fine to be there for dinner on my first night. They were all dressing when I arrived, and I had to go straight to the room and waste no time. Might even have kept dinner waiting a bit, for I was the last one down, and it announced within a minute of my entering in the drawing room. Now, people used to, like, dress for dinner. I, they did, yeah. And Especially I'm, like, out there in my pajamas with a hole in my pants and a stain on my shirt. <laughs> with last night's dinner stain yeah. and, like, crosses yeah. on the shirt that yeah. you're wearing. Yeah. But they, yeah. they got dressed, you know. <laughs> um, they got dressed. And then they had fancy dinner, yeah. and they would have, they'd play games in the parlor before dinner, and then after dinner, they'd all meet in the parlor and For have After port. dinner drinks. Port, yeah. yeah. And smokes. Mm-hmm. There was just time to say hello to everybody I knew, and to be briefly introduced to two or three I didn't know, and then I had to give my arm to Miss Gold Gorman. I mentioned this as the reason why I didn't catch the name of the tall, dark, handsome girl I hadn't met yet before. I don't want anyone calling me handsome. I don't, I don't feel that's a compliment to me. I don't like handsome. the I don't like the word handsome for a woman for me? yourself. I, for me, I mean, I, other people might be fine. She's it. a handsome woman. I know. I feel like that's not. <laughs> it's, it's like you're kind of. It's kind of insulting. There, like sometimes people I feel say like it, it, it's and meant it, to be insulting. Yeah. So that's why I'm insulted by it. Everything was rather hurried, and I'm always bad at catching people's names. She looked cold and clever and rather forbidding. The sort of girl who gives the impression of knowing all about men. And the more she knows of them, the less she likes them. Well, that's about my, I feel. (laughs) I'm with the tall, handsome woman. woman. (laughs) I felt that I wasn't going to hit it off with this particular lamb of violets. But she looked interesting all the same, and I wondered who she was. I didn't ask because I was pretty sure hearing somebody address her by name before very long. Unluckily, though, I was a long way off her at table. Miss Gorman was at the top of her form that night. I soon forgot to worry about who she might be. Miss Gorman is one of the most amusing women I know. An outrageous but quite innocent flirt with very rightly wit, which isn't always unkind. She can think half a dozen moves ahead in conversation, just as an expert can in a game of chess. We were soon sparring, or rather, I was covering against the ropes, and I quite forgot to ask her name in the undertone of the name of the cold, proud beauty. She's cold and proud? I don't feel like that's a compliment either. The lady on the other side of me was a stranger and had been until a few minutes since, and I didn't think of seeking information in that quarter. There's so many words. There was a it's, round like, it's like he's describing things that kind of aren't necessary to the yeah. story. Yeah. There was around a dozen of us, including the Sangstons themselves, and we were all young and or trying to be. And you're saying that the old ladies who were probably nearing fifty, Margaret. The These s- old ladies are probably thirty. I know. The the Sangstons themselves were the oldest members of the party, and their son Reggie, in his last year of Marlboro, must have been the youngest. When there was talk of games, playing games after dinner, it was he who suggested Smee. He told us how to play it just as I've described to you. His father chipped in as soon as we all understood 
what was going to be required of us. If there are any games of that sort going on in the house, he said, for goodness sakes, be careful of the back stairs on the first floor landing. There's a door to them I've often meant to take it down. In the dark, anybody who doesn't know the house very well might think of walking into a room. A girl actually did break her neck on those stairs about 10 years ago when Angsties lived here. I asked how it happened. If you have a door onto stairs that you have been, and someone broke their neck because they thought it was a room and fell down the stairs. I've been meaning why to take it Why wouldn't you take it off before? Or leave the door open. Or keep it open. Prop it Please. open. Please. Oh, said Sangston. There was a party here one Christmas time, and they were playing hide and seek as you proposed doing. This girl was one of the hiders. She heard somebody coming, ran along the passage to get away, and opened the door of what she thought was a bedroom, evidently with the intention of hiding behind it as the pursuer went past. Unfortunately, it was the door leading to the back stairs, and that staircase is as straight and almost as steep as a shaft of a pit. She was dead when they picked her up. Oh, good. (laughs) As a shaft of a pit. And she was dead. And she was dead. Okay. We all promised for our own sakes to be careful. Miss Gorman said that she was sure nothing could happen to her since she was insured by three different firms. And her next of kin was a brother who consistently ill luck was by word in the family. So she could never die because he would never be lucky enough to inherit the money. Oh, <laughs> you see, none of us had known the unfortunate girl. And as the tragedy was 10 years old, there was no need to pull long faces about it. Who cares about the stupid girl who fell down the stairs and broke her neck? Well, we started the game almost immediately after dinner. The men allowed themselves only five minutes before joining the ladies. And then young Reggie Sankston went round and assured himself that the lights were all out, except for the servants' quarters in the drawing room where we assembled. We then got busy with 12 sheets of paper, which he twisted into pellets and shook them up in his hand before passing round. Eleven of them were blank, and the SME was written on the twelfth. The person drawing the latter was the one who had to hide. I looked and saw that mine was blank. A moment later, out went the electric light. And in the darkness, I heard somebody get up and creep out the door. After a minute or so, somebody gave the signal, and we made a rush for the door. I, for one, hadn't the least idea which of the party was Smee. For five or ten minutes, we were all rushing up and down the passageway, in and out of rooms, challenging one another. Smee? Smee? In the dark? Yeah, you have to do it in the dark. That's kind of fun. Yeah. And dangerous. I would definitely. I would have fallen down the stairs and broke my neck. I would too. Even if there wasn't a door. I have fallen down the stairs and broken myself. You just thankfully it wasn't your neck. Right. After a bit of alarums and excursions died down, and I guess that Smee was found, eventually I found the chain of people all sitting still and holding their breath on some narrow stairs leading up to a row of of attics. I hastily joined it. Having challenged and been answered with silence, and presently two more stragglers arrived, each racing the other to avoid being last. Sangston was one of them. Indeed, it was he who marked down for a forfeit, and after a while, after a little while, he remarked in an undertone, I think we're all here now, aren't we? He struck a match, looked up the shaft of the staircase, and began to count. It wasn't hard, although he, we just about filled the staircase, for we were sitting each a step or two above the next, and all our heads were visible. Nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, he counted, and then laughed. Dash it, that's one too many. The match had burned out, and he struck another one and began to count. He got as far as twelve, and then uttered an explanation. There are thirteen people here, explained. I haven't counted myself yet. Oh, nonsense, I laughed. You probably began with yourself, and now you want to count yourself twice. Out came his son's electric torch, giving the brighter and steadier light. Electric torch. (laughs) Flashlight, yeah. And we all began to count. Of course, we number 12. Sankston laughed. Well, he said, I could have sworn I counted 13 twice. From halfway up the stairs came Violet Sankston's voice with a little nervous thrill to it. I thought there was somebody sitting two steps above me. Have you moved up, Captain Ransom? Ransom said that he hadn't. He had said that he thought there was somebody sitting between Violet and himself. Just for a moment, there was an uncomfortable something in the air, a little cold ripple which tur- touched us all. For that little moment, it seemed to all of us, I think, that something odd and unpleasant had happened. 
and was liable to happen again. Then we laughed at ourselves, at one another, and were comfortable once more. There were only 12 of us, and we, there could only have been 12 of us, and there was no arguing about it. Still laughing, we trooped back to the drawing room and began again. This time I was Smee, and Violet Sangston ran me to the earth while I was still looking for hiding place. That round didn't last long, and we were chain of 12 within two to three minutes. Afterwards, there was a short interval. Violet wanted a rap fetched for her. Okay, yeah. I was like, what? Her rap. She wanted a oh, rap. She was cold. She was cold. He was no sooner gone than Reggie pulled me by the sleeve. I saw that he had, he looked he looked pale and sick. Quick, he whispered. My father is out. Take me to the smoke room and give me a brandy or whiskey or something. Outside the room, I asked him what was the matter, but he didn't answer at first. And I thought it better to dose him first and question him afterwards. So I mixed him a pretty dark complexioned brandy and soda, which he drank at a gulp and then began to puff as if he were running. I had a rather turn, he said, in a sheepish grin. What's the matter? I don't know. You were Smee just now, weren't you? Well, of course. I didn't know who Smee was. And while my mother and the others ran into the West Wing and found you, I turned east. There was a deep clothes cupboard in my bedroom. I marked it down as a good place to hide when it turned, when it was my turn, and I had the idea that Smee might be there. I opened the dark, the door in the dark, and felt around and touched somebody's hand. Smee, I whispered, not getting any answer. I thought it was Smee. Well, I don't know how it was, but this old creepy feeling came over me, or this odd creepy feeling came over me. I can't describe it, but I felt that something was wrong. So I turned on my electric torch, and there was nobody there. Now I swear I touched a hand, and I was filling up the doorway of the cupboard at the time, so nobody could have gotten past me. He puffed again. What do you make of it, he asked. You imagined that you touched a hand, I answered naturally, naturally, naturally enough. He uttered with a short laugh. Of course, I knew you were going to say that. I must have imagined it, mustn't I? He paused and swallowed. I mean, it couldn't have been anything else but imagination, could it? I assured him that it couldn't, meaning that what I said, and he accepted this, but rather with a ph philosophy of one who knows he's right, but doesn't expect to be believed. We returned together to the drawing room where, by that time, they were all waiting for us and ready to start again. It may have been my imagination, although almost sure it wasn't, but it seemed to me that all enthusiasm for the game had suddenly melted like a white frosting in a strong sunlight. <laughs> <laughs> if somebody had suggested another game, I sure we would have all been grateful to abandon Smee. Only nobody did. Nobody seemed to like to. I, for one, and I can speak for some of the others, too, was oppressed with the feeling that there was something wrong. I couldn't have said what I thought was wrong. Indeed, I didn't think about it at all. But somehow, all the sparkle had gone out of the fun, and hovering over my mind like a shadow was the warning of the sixth sense which told me that there was an influence in the house, which is neither sane, sound, or healthy. Why did I feel that? Because Sangston had counted thirteen of us instead of twelve, and his son had thought he had touched somebody in an empty cupboard. No, there was more to it than just that. One would have laughed at such things in an ordinary way, and it was just that feeling of something being wrong which stopped me from laughing. Well, we started again, and when we went to the pursuit of the unknown Smee, we were as noisy as ever, and it seemed to me that most of us were acting. Frankly, for no reason other than the one I've given to you, we had stopped enjoying the game. I had the instinct to hunt the main pack, but after a few minutes, during which no Smee was found, my instinct was to play winning games and be first, if possible. Set me searching on my own account count and on the first floor of the west wing following the wall which was actually the shell of the house i blundered against a pair of human knees i put out my hand and touched a soft velvet curtain then i knew where i was there was a tall deeply recessed window with seats along the landing and curtains over the recess to the ground somebody was sitting in the corner of the window seat behind the curtain aha i had caught smee so i drew the curtain aside stepped in and touched a bare arm of a woman it was a dark night outside, and moreover, the window was not only curtained, but a blind hung down to where the bottom pane joined up on the frame. Between the curtain and the window, it was a dark as the plague of Egypt. 
I could not have seen the hand held six inches in my face, much less a woman sitting in the corner. Smee, I whispered, and no answer. Smee, when challenged, does not answer. So I sat beside her, first in the field, to await the others. Then, having settled myself, I leaned over and said, Who is it? What is your name, Smee? Now the darkness beside me whispered back, Brenda Ford. I didn't know the name, but because I didn't know, I guessed it was at once who she was, the tall, pale, dark, handsome girl, the only person in the house I didn't know by name. Ergo, my companion was the tall, pale, dark girl. It seemed rather intriguing to be there with her, shut between the heavy curtain and the window, and I rather wondered whether she was enjoying the game we were playing. (laughs) He was enjoying sitting there with her. Somehow she hadn't seen to me to be the one romp of the romping sort. I muttered one or two commonplace questions to her and had no answer. Smee is a game of silence. Smee, the person or persons who were found, Smee, are supposed to keep quiet and make it hard for the others. But there was nobody else about, and it occurred to me that she was playing the game a little too much to the letter. I spoke again and got no answer, and then I began to be annoyed. This is just like a man mad because you didn't oh, you're smile not, at Oh, him. you're going to ignore me? Oh, you're going to ignore me, even though that's part of the game? What an asshole. And all of a sudden, she's a, a, a handsome bitch. Yeah. <laughs> well, you're just a bitch. Yeah, I know. You're she, a tease. Yeah. Because I sat here? Because you, you're sitting there. She was of that cold superior type, which affects to despise men. She didn't like me, and she was sheltered behind the rules of the game for children to be discourteous. What an asshole. Oh, my God. Well, if she didn't like me sitting there with her, I certainly didn't want to be sitting there with her. I half turned from her and began to hope that she would both be discovered without much more delay. Having discovered that I didn't like being there alone with her, it was queer how soon I found myself hating it, and that for the reason very different from the one which had first whetted my annoyance. Oh, girl, he liked it until she stopped talking yeah. to him. The girl I had met for the first time before dinner and seen diagonally across the table had a sort of cold charm about her, which had attracted while it had half angered me. Mm-hmm. For the girl who was with me, imprisoned in the opaque darkness between the curtain and the window, I felt no attraction at all. Asshole. It was so very much fragile for male fragility yeah, right there. That I should have wondered... Uh. wondered at myself if after the first shock of discovery that she was suddenly become repellent to me i had <laughs> had room in my mind for anything besides the consciousness that her close presence was an increasing horror to me oh yeah you're yeah. horrified by this is fragile male ego yeah. can't take it it came upon me just as quickly as i uttered the words my flesh suddenly shrank from her as if you you see a strip of gel- gelatin shrink and wither from the heat of a fire. You know fire. what flesh he's talking about. Yeah. His, 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 uh, his fragile pain. male flesh. Yeah. <laughs> Hell, it shrank. Because before that, it wasn't it shrinking. It wasn't shrinking. No. That feeling of something being wrong had come back to me, but multiplied to the extent which turned foreboding into actual terror. I firmly believe that I should have gotten up and run if it if I had not felt that if my movement, she would have divined my intention and compelled me to stay by some means of which I could not bear to think. Oh yeah, she wouldn't want you to this move. This guy doesn't play hide and seek because at one point he was stuck in an alcove with a with a hot ghost who didn't yeah. want anything to do with him and his male ego couldn't, couldn't take it. not handle it. it. <laughs> the memory of having touched her bare arm made me wince and draw in my lips. I prayed that somebody would come along soon. My prayer was answered. Light footfalls sounded on the landing. Somebody on the other side of the curtain brushed against my knee. The curtain was drawn aside, and the woman's hand, fumbling in the darkness, presented to my shoulder, rested on my shoulder. Smee whispered the voice, which I instantly recognized as Miss Gorman's, all the one he had the hops for that flirted with him. Of course, she received no answer. She came and settled down beside me with a rustle, and I can't describe the sense of relief she brought me. It's Tony, isn't it? She whispered. Yes, I whispered back. You're not Smee, are you? No. She's on the other side. She reached a hand across me and heard one of her nails scratch the surface of the woman's silk gown. Hello, Smee. How are you? Who are you? Oh, is it against the rules to talk? Never mind, Tony. We'll break the rules. Do you know, Tony? This game is beginning to irk me a little. I think they're not going to run it to death by playing it all night. I'd like to play some game where we all could be together in the same room in the nice bright fire. 
Same here, I agreed fervently. Can't you suggest something when we go down? There's something rather uncanny in this particular amusement. I can't quite shed the delusion that there's somebody in this game who ought to be in it at all. God, this is a little wordy. <laughs> that was just how I had been feeling. But I didn't say so. But for my part, the worst of my qualms were now gone. At least this guy was gone. saved by a nice young girl. Yes. The arrival of Miss Gorman had dissipated them. We sat on talking, wondering from time to time when the rest of the party would arrive. I don't know how long it elapsed before we heard the clatter of feet in the landing of young Reggie's voice yelling, Hello, hello, anybody there? Yes, I answered. Miss Gorman with you? Yes. Well, you're a nice pair. You both forfeited. We're all waiting for you for hours. Why, you haven't found Smee yet, I objected. You haven't, you mean. I happen to have been Smee myself, but Smee's here with us, I cried. Yes, agreed Miss Gorman. The curtain was stripped aside, and in the moment we were blinking at the eye, into the eye of Reggie's electric torch. I looked at Miss Gorman, and then to my other side, between me and the wall, there was an empty space on the curtain seat. I stood up at once and wished I hadn't, for I found myself sick and dizzy. There was somebody he there, did. I maintained, because I touched her. Of course you touched her, you perv. Yeah, so did I, her. said Miss Gorman in a voice that had lost its steadiness. And I don't see how she could have gotten past without us knowing. Reggie uttered a queer, shaken laugh. He, too, had been an unpleasant experience that evening. Somebody's been playing a goat, he remarked, coming down. We were not very popular when we arrived in the drawing room. Reggie rather tactlessly gave it out that we were found sitting in the window seat behind the curtain. I taxed the tall, dark girl with having pretended to be Smee and afterwards slipping away, and she denied it, after which we settled down and played other games. Smee was done with for the evening, and I, for one, was glad for it. Some long while later, during an interval, Sangston told me if I wanted to, a drink and to go into the smoke room and help myself. I went, and he presently followed. He's going to take it out on that poor girl. I could see that he was rather peeved with me, and the reason came out during the following minute or two. It seemed that, in his opinion, if I must sit out and flirt with Miss Gorman in circumstances which would have considered highly compromising in his young days, I need to do it during a round of a game and keep everyone waiting for us. But there was someone else there, I protested. Somebody pretending to be Smee. I believed it was the tall girl, Miss Ford. Although she denied it, she even whispered her name to me. Sangston stared at me and nearly dropped his glass. Miss who, he shouted. Brenda Ford. She told me her name. Sangston put down his glass and laid his hand on my shoulder. Look here, old man, he said. I don't mind a joke, but don't let it go too far. We don't want all the women in the house getting hysterical. <laughs> because the men are perfectly yeah. fine. They're all calm. Yes. Brenda Ford is the name of the girl who broke her neck on the stairs playing hide and seek for 10 like, years he's ago. He's the one who's gone hysterical. Yeah. The end. <laughs> <laughs> it's the guys who've gone hysterical. <laughs> so uh, it just basically showed that uh, that guy was a big douchebag who yeah. was hitting on a lady and when she didn't show any interest <laughs> she, he thought she was hot until she didn't show interest and then she was a cold bitch that he repelled his flesh <laughs> was, she was repellent to me she was repellent god that was a long story yeah anyway i hope you enjoyed our ghost tales on this even with the misogyny <laughs> even with the mis- they came yes. with a side of misogyny a side of misogyny and molestation <laughs> Yep. So we, we just wanted to carry on that tradition of ghost stories at Christmas time. So I hope you sat by a fire, sat by a lit candle, cozied up, got yourself some hot mold cider. Or my, or wine. And had your crocheting or your cro- Yeah. Your or as I finally call it, crotcheting. I crotcheted and Colleen told me ghost stories. Ghost story. I, my feel, Colleen feels like her throat is starting to lose its I know, voice. I, wrote, from all I the, read that one and I'm like... I I'm parched. I'm good. I'm parched good. from it. I'm parched from it. So if you want to hear more ghost tales, go online. We're gonna put I wanna put the link to the stories that I read um right in there. And a link to the book that I and read the, mine on. The book. And then there that that is um a whole series of books that have different ghost stories. So yeah, you can make it a tradition in your own family. And they're all like Victorian Christmas ghost stories. Right. These books and there's at least six of them. 
I thought there was more. They keep coming out with more of them. And they all, like, the one that I read from had, like, a candle with a skull yes. on the bottom. They're all cool. All the covers of them, because I saw many of the covers in Scribd when I was looking through it, yeah. um, have cool, like, artwork on the covers. So you can read, you can make it a tradition in your family to do, uh, on Christmas Eve, tell a ghost story around the fire. Or during Yule, tell a ghost story around the fire. Or read it. Uh, Charles Dickens a yeah. Christmas Carol. And he has short ghost stories too that were published in newspapers and magazines during the time. Um there were several different like famous authors that had ghost yeah. stories during that time. So my that are short stories. personal favorite version of a Christmas Carol is the Muppet one. Well yeah, that's fantastic. That one is amazing. Because the actor who plays Ebenezer Scrooge, at the end, after he wakes up and he's walking through that, he's singing the song. It just is so joyful. I love it so much. I it know. just makes me feel so happy. You know what I also do love is um, um, Patrick Stewart's Christmas Carol. Oh, and the one that Disney made, the animated one with Jim Carrey, that one's really good, too. I haven't watched that one. That one's really accurate to the book. Is it? From what I said, they tried to make it, like, Close to it. verbatim. And you know it's terrible? I've never read it. I've never read it, either. And it's not very long. No, because it was, I've like, heard. a short... Yeah, right. and I, short I feel like I book. should read it to my kids, but they're rotten and they just want to play on their they just want to watch stupid videos on their tablets yeah. they wouldn't even watch christmas movies what you should read it videotape yourself reading it and then put it on their tablet oh. and then maybe they would listen <laughs> you want your children to listen to a story well, read like, it to them know, and play it on their they, tablet actually they do like me reading them stories like they're probably more apt to sit and listen to me read them a story than to watch a movie with me oh well that's good have you watched the Santa Clauses? The series? Yeah. Not yet. I haven't finished it. Well, they had, it started last season and they have season Yeah, another two. season. I never finished the first season. Season two is awesome because there's no in it and her name's Olga and I love her. Awesome. And she's like a bad guy, but she's freaking adorable and I love her so much. I have to, I have to and catch up on that. And she with an accent and she's, she's mad. It's I just, love that. I love it so much. And the guy who plays, um... Mad Santa is the one gay husband from Modern Family. Oh, I love him. And when I, I, I was watching it and I'm like, who is that? He looks familiar. And then once you find, like, that's him? It's Cam. Yeah. And I didn't realize it till oh, I, I knew it. Him. And now I'm like, and he's, he talks in a, in a, he's a Trumpy voice. It's almost like he's, he's like pretending to be Donald Trump. <laughs> but like. Oh, like a parody of the boys and I'm just like That's okay funny. was he he's reminded me of oh he's reminded me of comedians who are trying to make yes. Donald Trump. That's, like, That's funny. Okay. Well we'll post pictures of um Victorian times. They used to have weird cards and stuff too that they sent out. So we'll post some pictures on Facebook and Instagram of that time period of the, of the Victorian sitting around the fire listening to the ghost stories and things like that on um, Facebook and Instagram. So go to the Cousins Weird podcast there. I have a funny story oh, that didn't. I meant to tell you okay. right now. Um, on Thanksgiving, mm-hmm. did I tell you about the... When I was laughing and I was getting into the car at my mom's house? No. No, it wasn't Thanksgiving. It was something. I was getting into the car... Um. It was at night. We were at my mom's house, and we were all getting into the car. It was Jessica's birthday. Happy Jessica's birthday. Okay. And um, we <laughs> we're in, we're in the car, and uh, I was Ruben was driving. The kids were all in the back seat, right? And I open the door, and I sit half on the seat. One my foot is one foot's out on the ground. Yeah. And I'm kind of s- sitting sideways and I sit down and I'm taking my purse off and I set it down and I go, Oh, I should ask my mom if I could, uh, I was like, I should ask my mom if I could borrow the van tomorrow. And I, I just said, I should ask. And Ruben goes, you shan't. <laughs> I should ask. <laughs> and I'm like, what? And he goes, you shan't. I go, no, I should ask. And he goes, you shat. Like, oh, I'm like no. dying. And Ruby's in the back seat. What is shat? <laughs> <laughs> what does shat mean? Yeah. And Ruby goes, if I thought she shit her pants, so don't say shat. It's a bad word. She's like, shat? And he's like, stop saying shat. And I'm laughing so hard. And I'm like, 
laugh crying up the, <laughs> the steps to my mom's uh, front door, and she's like, "Oh my god, what happened?" I'm she like, "I'm <laughs> laughing, like I you were an crying." Idiot. I like laugh crying. I'm like I need to know if I can. And then I had to tell her the whole. Yeah. I should ask. I chat. I chat. I chat. Ask. <laughs> you chat. <laughs> You're sitting weird. Like you're sitting on your side. And you go, I should ask. <laughs> you shat. He's like, oh, all wow. like, you shat. He's all, he's so horrifying. <laughs> I'm like, I didn't shat. <laughs> Nothing says Merry Christmas like shat. <laughs> Shitting your pants in the car. <laughs> I'd be like, I shat. <laughs> like, this cat, like, I shat. <laughs> you shat. <laughs> See, and this is how I responded to it. I thought it was the funniest thing ever, and he's laughing his ass off. The kids are in the backseat going, What's shat? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. <laughs> Ruby. What does shat even mean? <laughs> oh, golly. Oh. Do you have any stories you want to share with us about, about shatting your pants? Shatting. <laughs> Where can they email us? <laughs> Definitely. Um, you can email us at thecousinsweird at gmail.com and just put in the the thing, shat. I shat. I, <laughs> I shat. I shat myself. <laughs> <laughs> or you can send us a direct message through Facebook or Instagram. Make sure you share our episodes with your friends. If you... Uh, want to give them an early Christmas present, just send them the link to this episode. I mean, you don't even to buy them a present this year. Just send them a link to this episode and it'll be a gift. This even girl shat. This girl shat her pants. Um, even though they were long, wordy stories, it was true to the times. Yeah, it's We took fun. you back in time. We did. So I hope you enjoyed it. Um, you can go to our patreon.com back so it's is weird. For a dollar a month, become a freaky friend, and you get a free sticker and bonus content. And for two, $5 a month, become a terrible trender, you get free sticker, bonus content, yearly gift, and ad-free episodes. Um, I hope you have you a could, great holiday. Yeah, and you can um, make some horrible Victorian pastry that's made with lard and chicken parts, and, you know, because they did that back then, too. And they listen did a lot to of this things. and not vomit over your food. Put some mercury-laden... <laughs> Makeup on your face, yeah, right. corset yourself up, and pass and out. And then wear your flammable crinoline. Yes, and then <laughs> celebrate Christmas with, with candles on your dead, dry tree. <laughs> I don't think anybody lived through the Victorian I don't know how they did it. They didn't burn themselves to the ground, either with their clothing or their Christmas tree. <laughs> yes. Christmas tree, their clothing, the fire. They're just walking around in a big flammable ball of... Or they're, they're what, those acetate collars yes. that strangle themselves. Them. Or they're poisoning themselves with the makeup they're wearing, the or they're the food eating, they're or eating, their or the they're medicine they're taking, or the green stuff on the wall. Green right. wallpaper. Yes. All right. Stay freaky. Happy Yule. Merry holidays. 